to in my section it's going to be a little repetitive but it's fine it's i love fine. it we're here Let's we're saying it. words we're saying words and we're doing stuff um <gasps> could it be that vampires have a similar theme to that of the succubus and werewolf yes, yes. uh <laughs> i'm <shockingly, laughs> vampires like other monstrous creatures exist to represent societal fears of people acting outside societal norms they are a literary and cultural tool to dissuade individuals from acting in certain ways um, and fear those who do and ultimately ostracize the existence of the other whatever that is throughout history um, what was disappointing about this film as we talked about uh, is, is that it didn't present anything new or especially interesting to the idea of the vampire as well as just being blatantly offensive um, and maybe it wasn't trying to uh, I think it's pretty obvious that it was it wasn't trying to uh, but vampires can be a great tool when used correctly uh, for representation in that monsters in film literature and other media often are coded to represent the other and push back against like the oppressive forces. And in some cases like this one, reinforce them mm -hmm. um, when approaching the monster as feminine, there are so many opportunities where the presentation can act as a commentary on feminism, as well as intersectionality. They don't have to exist as separate things. Yeah. Um, and this film, unfortunately, missed that opportunity entirely. It felt like it was an early 2000s film, despite the fact being made in 2021, in that it, had, it was filled to the brim with BIPOC characters, but did not give any of them autonomy, depth, or power that was afforded to the white protagonist. Um, instead, it used them as fodder for this white woman who ultimately only cared about how the patriarchy impacted her personally mm -hmm. um, and never, as you said, got to achieve that power. And any power that she did get to achieve was achieved through cannibalizing the BIPOC characters in the towns as a mean to stand up to her white man husband while simultaneously benefiting from his status um, and yep. his pull with the local police force. Oh, my God. Um, the approach was really tone deaf, as Gabe, and I, Gabe shouted. I'm shouting with. It was really tone deaf. Just the, how was it? How did none of no one watched it and was like, "Hey, maybe we change this. Maybe we don't." Like what? Maybe no. Why isn't anyone asking him? Like, what do you want? What did you want to do? What is your goal? Okay, if we're taking like the literary thing where you pick a backpack, you have a backpack, you mm -hmm. put all the things in the book backpack. What was your What was your goal at the end of the hike? What yeah, was the why, goal at the end you with your backpack? What, what did you want to achieve? Because um, you didn't achieve, if it was to make a movie that just reinforces the patriarchy and is bad, mm -hmm. then you did that. Congrats. You did a great job, guys. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but as Gabe kind of got into, it was really upsetting the presentation of Amelia, who is just as much dealing with her newfound vampirism. And in for whatever reason is viewed as less worthy as surviving in the eyes of Anne and apparently this entire town, despite the fact that they're facing this like same oppressive patriarchal force. Mm -hmm. um, and Anne starts the film expressing very performative worry about Amelia only to quickly jump to demonize her and dismiss her personhood as soon as it is inconvenient to her. Yep. Um, and the film continues to follow Anne and her journey of centering herself uh, <laughs> as she actively murders and hurts the BIPOC men and women around her for her own gain. Um, the field, film ends with this muddy and grossly unaware representation of white feminism, if I've ever seen one. Um, and it's likely that while we went into this film expecting so much more, that it's passed for so long because lots of people don't go into films expecting them to be better or different. Mm -hmm. um, go into them passively as gives it like not wanting to critique them when some films need to be critiqued, especially if they're going to exist within a genre that like we really love because of the fact that it's always saying things and putting yeah. like powerful statements out there. And it doesn't always have to do that, but it also needs to not actively do harm at the same time. Mm -hmm. Like it'd be one thing if it was just a fun vampire film and like, that's what we were expecting, but it clearly positioned itself as if it was trying to say something and then actively harmed what yeah. it probably classified as its audience in trying yeah. to say it. Um, so it tried to, it positioned itself as it was going to say something interesting taking a stance against oppressive patriarchal religious space and then carelessly and without actually saying anything meaningful, just threw that away. Yep. 
to which I say, oh, well, <laughs> maybe yeah. we'll get to make films one day and we'll do different. <laughs> or maybe 2021, there will just be so many wonderful 2022. We're in a different year, whatever. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? In future, the future times will have mm-hmm. different films that do a better job. But- Hashtag fund the ghouls. <laughs> <laughs> the goals we'll do it i promise yeah. gave us so many monstrous film scripts like <laughs> i will put the money where my mouth is she has at least three i yeah. just want to say that <laughs> i've read them and they're great so yeah. um but yes uh the monstrous feminine can be used as a tool to challenge oppression and when it's done right it's so exciting um the use of the vampire has been used in media by both the oppressor using the monster as a way to demonize as well as the oppressed taking back that monster um as a point of catharsis and healing while this film didn't achieve either we have watched some really fun vampire films that maintained a level of wit and awareness such as wit bit vampire in the bronx so vam and others mm-hmm. uh And when discussing the monstrous femme and monsters in general, it's important to recognize what can classify someone as a monster. How do you get deemed a monster by society, vampire, werewolf, succubus, whatever have you, because they all kind of overlap. Mm -hmm. Um, And to that, I say it's really simple. You exist outside the domestic space, monster. You exist outside the nine to five daylight hours, monster. You exist outside the heteronormative, monster you exist as a confident sexual being monster you exist in your skin and that skin is not white monster i could go on and on Mm -hmm. because societal othering creates this idea of the monster and that can be applied to so many different things and is largely influenced by social trends so the result being to literally just exist as your authentic self if that is a threat to those who don't is the superficial societal construct dubbing you a monster because that's easier than changing the system. If you can silence the voices that are different from the ones that are in power, that is easier than letting them actually change anything that's happening. Um, And it's also unfortunately been used as a tool throughout history to justify countless atrocities done to those others, be it through witch and werewolf trials, wanton assault and murder, or just general ostracism ostracization or disenfranchising Mm -hmm. um today we're talking about vampires specifically though so i'll provide some facts Um, according to history.com there are almost as many different characteristics of vampires as there are vampire legends but the main characteristic of vampires is they drink human blood and they typically drain their victim's blood using sharp fangs, killing them, and or and or turning them into vampires themselves. Um, we've seen many renditions of the vampire throughout the film and literary history. There are vampires that sparkle, the vampires that can't be in the sun, uh, vampires that, if they consume enough blood, do get to go out in the sun. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the forever fun, like, let's subvert the usual understanding of what a vampire is uh, and like the things that are actually weak against are really empowering for them or just like really kind of flipping on its head. What is understood of like a vampire is and making it different. So the way vampires are represented in media is similar to the way vampires are represented in history and are often used to explain things that people may not understand. Um, The understanding of vampirism in the middle ages, for example, surrounds the fear of the spread of the plague. Um, Mm. This kind of stemmed from a lack of understanding surrounding the ways in which viruses spread, as well as the way the body decomposes. So in one example there, uh, in the middle ages they whenever a plague would take out an entire family they -hmm. would think it was vampirism because of like the bad luck associated with it as well as like the mass loss of life Mm. um and because of the fact that they didn't understand how decomposition happened that that lots of plague ridden bodies would have blood pouring out of their mouths and that was a common thought to exist as vampirism Um, But there are instances of illnesses that impact one its ability to be out in the sunlight, such as porphyra, is my guess, that are misunderstood and also deemed as vampirism because of the skin reaction to sunlight and how it blisters. Um, Some symptoms of porphyra can be temporarily relieved by ingesting blood, uh, apparently, Uh, and other diseases blamed for promoting the vampire myth include rabies and goiter. So vampirism was also used as a scapegoat for various horrific historical events, but also used as a reason for plague deaths, bad luck, and even literal serial killers, among other things. Um, Throughout history, there are references made to vampires that 
in viewing in hindsight, there's a scientific perspective that makes them seem less realistic. Um, but that's really most things. Uh, <laughs> yeah. You look at them and you're like, wow, yeah, no, we have a better understanding about what the world is. So now uh, we're not we see that for what it actually is. And we <laughs> yeah. don't think it was a monster murdering monsters of people. Um, but the history.com article goes on to outline whether or not vampires are real and says vampire superstition thrived in the Middle Ages, especially as the plague decimated entire towns. The disease often left behind bleeding mouth lesions on its victims, which to be the uneducated was a sure sign of vampirism. It wasn't uncommon for anyone with an unfamiliar physical or emotional illness to be labeled as a vampire as well. When a suspected vampire died, their bodies were often disinterred which i believe means like you dig them up um to search for signs of vampirism and in some cases the stake was thrust through the corpse's heart to make sure they stayed dead um other accounts describe the decapitation and burning of the corpses suspected of suspected vampires well into the 19th century um, there was actually an example uh where they suspected in rhode island i don't remember exactly the year but that they had suspected the daughter of this family was a vampire because the entire family died of illness, um, tuberculosis, I believe specifically. Mm. Um, and what they did was even worse because there were some children who survived, but because they thought the child was a vampire, they burned her and then made the brother of her eat the ashes in attempts to cure him of any potential oh, harm. And he died because you're not supposed to consume dead people, yeah. uh, especially the ashes of dead people. Especially um, when there's ter- tuberculosis. Rampant. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Um, so it r- largely stemmed from a lot of misunderstandings associated just like with health um, mm-hmm. and with what bodies can do. Uh, and instead of just being like bodies do stuff, that's crazy. Um they, <laughs> they like, evil. Always, it's it's because evil it's uh, literally you've done something so this is why um but similar to zombies the fear with these things coming back from the dead coming back to hurt you as well as things entering the living plane that ultimately shouldn't be here anymore exist as this like fear of what my partner described as like fear of accountability in some sense <laughs> <laughs> um the existence of vampires themselves directly challenge the Christian understanding of the afterlife and the fear of the undead demons and others surrounding death practices is something that's oftentimes motivated by Eurocentric thinking. So considering a lot of American media is heavily influenced by Eurocentric thinking. It makes sense why a lot of our understanding of the vampire and like of horror ends up being told through a Eurocentric lens. Um, My partner Isaiah, as I said, brought up that it could stem from a fear of being held accountable for actions and that specifically Christianity and Eurocentricism kind of tie together in that there were millions of atrocities committed by Mm -hmm. that entity um, and that the fear of the undead could more often represent the fear of being held accountable for the countless atrocities that took place at their hands in thinking of colonialism, imperialism, and other isms that were committed by white Europeans and Americans, et cetera. Uh, it's not a stretch to think that there may be a subconscious fear that one day there will be a collective vengeance that might force one to atone for those sins. If mm. thinking about the fact that Catholicism as well as Christian, there's, there's a level of atoning for the things that have taken place, uh, yeah. that that would be like a natural fear even. to have. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that the millions murdered could come back for vengeance to get back at them for their unjust ends, or even someone who's lived through the horror of everything that is humanity, all the atrocities that have taken place and can out that history mm. um, for what it actually is. My point ultimately here is to highlight the fact that the fear of the undead is not a universal thing, that there are lots of cultures uh, and different places around the world that have a different relationship with death and ancestry, um, and that it's not a universal thing to fear the Mm -hmm. afterlife or death. Um, So I think vampire stories could look very different if told from like different lenses. Yeah. Um, 
The other side of vampire representation is less about the fear of vampires and more of the allure of the idea of the vampire, the power of being a vampire and escaping from the short sighted human experience Um, that being a vampire would be a point of power for those who have been victimized by systems of oppression enacting that vengeance and vigilantism that they've kind of like been without Um, vampires also provide a pathway to power uh, in that they have, the strength and special abilities associated with them that usually there's like a level of like superhuman strength, um, not having you sleep during the day. So you have a different point of time in which you can enact such vengeance, kind of mm-hmm. like Batman. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, and there are those who see the vampire experience as a way to kind of gain power within lives where they don't feel like they have that power, a lack of belonging in a space that you have like in cut like vampire kind of like witch covens like vampire collectivism there's like Mm -hmm. community that can be established through that um that would give a level of a lack of belonging or a sense of belonging in a general space of lack of belonging um if we're thinking bit and how like the goal of that vampire collective was to kill all the gross awful men that preyed on women uh there's like also a power that comes with the monstrous feminine vampire and that you're you have a ownership of your sexuality and be sexually free to live openly however you want um, and freeing oneself from the oppressive patriarchal standards of gender roles as well. Like owning your sexuality because no one can really tell you otherwise because you're going to live forever and they're eventually going to die and their opinions don't matter. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, just escaping death is also something that could be like really exciting and powerful and freeing. Um, and that freeness is kind of what makes vampire is very interesting in addition to being scary in some lights uh just because there's a lot of simplicity and short-sightedness that exists in humanity if you think about how climate change has taken place it's because everyone just doesn't think about what the future is going to look like yeah (laughs) or specifically far enough into the future yeah Yeah. they're like this is the time that we're here so it's we're gonna do it you know and then what happens next no one cares um yeah, that's not my problem that's somebody yeah. else's problem we're like vampires if they're here the whole time they, it's definitely they're like hey no it's actually a problem i've seen this a lot of times yeah, yeah. and it's that's really like think. there are really like you were saying there are some really great vampire films and like we've covered vampires a few times um we did uh the monsters of love in our love gone wrong se- or romance gone wrong series where we talked uh-huh. about only lovers left alive and just talked about that um but even yeah with like the zombies like the fear that like the uh repercussions of your actions or animated yeah. and come back and stare you in the face and take vengeance um and that maybe you're not the hero this time um <laughs> but also i was thinking like with the procedures that they did with like uh exhuming bodies and then uh harming them after like their death like um like staking them or burning them or doing those things yeah. it's like you are um I'm totally blanking on the word, but it's just like you're disrespecting. Yeah, desecrating. Yeah, you're desecrating these these graves and these bodies, which can be a really big, um, like uh, in certain cultures and and just like places in the world, like that is really a severe thing to happen to your loved ones to to disrespect and abuse their bodies after they're gone can have a really severe impact on the way that like based on how you envision afterlife or what happens after death and so um there's just so like it's like ignorant and it's um yeah disrespectful because it's coming from the lens of how you envision the uh, afterlife and what your yeah. culture is saying eurocentric death yes. practices so uh, it's just like oh it just like <laughs> never stops it just keeps on getting worse so many layers yeah it's gross and sad um yeah. but um <laughs> I mean, yeah. And it's like, I had so much hope because I was like, okay, you have this, like, I was hoping there would be more to say about the fact that she is Christian too. Um, yeah. Because she's like in a home, she's a vampire who lives in this house that had a bunch of crucifix, like throughout the house. She had like yeah. the pieces of garlic that were just like hanging on, like, the wall, in the, yeah. on the wall. Like she can look in mirrors. Like there's all these things that they were subtly disproving as far as like vampires go. And the fact, yeah. but like, I was like, she's this Christian wife, but she's going to be a vampire. And her husband is a pastor who thinks that he can exercise her. And there should be so much more to be said about the fact that he can't, because there's nothing wrong with her. Um, but that wasn't, that was Ben and Evan. (laughs) He exercised by just stabbing people, uh, and getting away with it in the end. Yeah. 
Yeah. Um, I had the the one thing was uh, when we first started watching, there's like sermons in the beginning and he's like talking about being a good partner and a good wife or whatever. Yeah. And I was like, when I grew up in the South uh, in Florida, there we had this really small church that we attended uh-huh. uh, that was like, it was like wood, you know, <laughs> it's like that someone helped them build it kind of yeah. small in the middle of the woods church and the pastor there um he was a nice man but i just remember one of the sermons was like similar in that vein of like you need to be a good wife and take care of your husband and all that but it was kind of uncomfortable because the pastor at the time had been dating this woman who was a part of the congregation Uh and it felt very like even i was like young i was in middle school and i was picking up on this like he was like Talking. She isn't taking me seriously. Yeah. And she needs to realize that I'm the one for her. And I was like, you cannot use <laughs> the word of God in the middle of like Sunday mass to like push <laughs> like that she needs to obey you and be yours and just like, you know, be, like marry you. And then eventually they did get married, which is gross. I wonder if they're still together. But I just remember being like 14 and being in the pews like this doesn't seem right. It seems like he's yeah. angry and he's taking it out and he's using this book that like we're supposed to care about uh, to, to push a message that has nothing to do with like us. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's just gr- the whole thing was honestly just really gross, too. And like thinking about that as well, just the way in which religion acts as a tool of the patriarchy, as well as like a tool of like anti LGBTQIA. Yeah. Stuff. Like, not every woman wants to be a wife to yeah. a husband. You know what I mean? Like not everyone wants a man. Yeah. So maybe talk about different stuff. Yeah. Uh, uh, the, they also don't have children, which I think is really important. Cause I wonder like that could have been talked about. Like, I wonder if he yeah. if has some resentment towards Anne for that, like not doing the role of the wife that is. Yeah. That and maybe that's why his like passive aggressive sermon was actually about. Uh, yeah like you didn't even have a child that's gonna take care of us and be belong to us yeah which is also just super gross because it's like women can do whatever that they want they want <laughs> their hearts, so yeah how dare um yes yes so <laughs> that is our review of jacob's wife which you can tell we hated i think yeah. the rest of the series is gonna be full of things that we enjoy hopefully um, definitely the next episode we enjoy uh i'm i don't know blew my mind and I haven't seen the girl with all the gifts but I definitely want to and I yeah. we will there are really amazing vampire films that in the future we will cover they just didn't fit into this like there's death by temptation but like that's a male vampire uh there's transfiguration also a male vampire um yeah. so there are things that like I want to cover those because they're saying really amazing things or or they're worth talking about it just didn't fit with this so um <laughs> if you yeah. if there is a film that you were like you should have covered this and it's not bit because <laughs> we've already done that uh, yeah. please let us know and so vam which we've also covered but that's yeah. not, uh the female vampires are peripheral um yeah. in that and so uh let us know we always want to hear definitely check out our ways to help section so you can see how you can support and actually do the work that this film like negatively impacted um yeah the white women syndrome i it really upset me i was like we just had gabby petito in that whole situation where there's like a young black girl who was missing at the same time under similar circumstances and no one heard about it but the world stopped to find gabby and we knew exactly where she was like i can't like okay um (laughs) you can go on forever about missing women so uh and maybe i will because we will do true crime at some point um yeah and i mean as gabe said check out the ways to help section because there are people who are doing not what Jacob's wife did uh, and are like real life practical applications for uh, these things. There are actual missing human beings that need to be found. Uh, Yeah. So help and support where you can. Um, Yeah. And don't get married. Delete your kids. Or just don't get married because it's an oppressive system. Yeah. Like literally. I don't want to be Here is a goat. Thank yeah. you. Now you are a wife. I've exchanged ownership from your father to your husband now. Like, I don't have yeah. either of those. <laughs> it's also like, okay, like, I'm not going to go on this tangent. But the way in which Catholicism as well as capitalism intersect with the patriarchy and selling human beings. Um, 
especially women, is really upsetting. It started in Italy at the birth of mercantile culture. Well, it didn't start there. Like, it just like that's one of the places. Uh, that's gross. selling women, yeah, yeah, in which we've talked about. And Where you're like, uh, I have definitely. a new wife, so I'm gonna murder or like set loose all the kids from my first wife, and uh, my first wife is dead, so uh, her name's erased from all history, uh, mm-hmm. replaced by new. Just look at King Henry the Eighth, and yeah. they just offed wives whenever he felt like it because they're less than. It happens all the time. Um, <laughs> history is gross. If it doesn't make you mad, you're not reading it right. Yeah, you're not um, paying attention. Yep. Uh, so I hope you hate this film. Don't watch it if you haven't yeah. already. Um, and uh, yeah. remember to like, subscribe, rate, review. We're on TikTok. Things. We're on TikTok. People like us there. Apparently. Who knew? Cool. We're yeah, hip. Uh, <laughs> but we'll see Yummy, you next cool. week. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye.